Hi everyone, here's the Bookemist once again. Today I'm reviewing White Sargasso Seas by Jean Rees. It would be an exaggeration to say that I read uh, Charles Bronte's Jane Eyre recently for the explicit purpose of being able to read White Sargasso Seas, but not by much. White Sargasso Seas always fascinated me with its status as one of the first texts in literature and in the history of postmodernism more specifically that collapse the boundary, completely arbitrary in the first place, between one text and the next, one of the first novels that made the entirely arbitrary and fictional, or the irony, nature of this boundary evident to many readers across the world. I always loved this idea of literature as a conversation between texts. Uh, it's an idea you find in Umberto Eco's The Name of the Rose. More recently I found it in uh, one of my favorite quotes by Michael Chabon, uh, the idea that all novels are sequels, and White Sargasso Seas is based on this concept. For those of you who don't know uh, about the text, White Sargasso Seas is a prequel to, Jane Eyre, uh, to Charles Bronte's Jane Eyre that works as a rewriting of the novel, in a way. Uh, parts of it are narrated by Mr. Rochester, but most of the narrative comes from the perspective of the character who is known in Jenner as Bertha, or more, is more widely known as the mad woman in the attic. Her name is Antoinette in White Sargasso Seas, and the way she moves from being Antoinette to becoming Bertha, who is her mother's name in the novel, is one of the most sinister and fascinating processes, I always almost want to call it subplots, going on in the novel. And it's as eerie I, and, and creepy as it is compelling to witness this character's transformation, because in a way, the great challenge of White Sargasso Seas, but probably of any prequel ever, is making the narrative compelling and making the character's evolution interesting with the added handicap that the reader probably already knows what's going to happen and where the characters are going to end up and what final outcome um, the events they're reading is going to have. If the characters are involved in a dangerous scene, they the reader kind of knows that they'll survive. Their armor plot, as I remember the, the term being from the world of manga, is basically indestructible. They sim simply cannot die or, or, or nothing too bad can really happen to them. White Sargasso Seas is still able to cram the story of Antoinette with a lot of tension and a lot of drama and danger. She is part of a family in the Caribbean. They were, they're, a, they're a Creole family, they are of European the sand, but they were born in the Caribbean, and they are excluded from all worlds in this post-slavery 19th century, where the natives and the, the black population distrust them and hates them because of the crimes of Antoinette's family and, and forefathers. But the European colonizers, people who come directly from the continent, from, the, from Europe, see them as inferior or not on the same level as them, and this leaves them in a sort of limbo where Antoinette has to fend for herself and where her very survival is tied to understanding the bizarre dynamics of this world. The great tension, especially in the first part of the novel, comes from this idea that's a light motif across the book, that Europeans coming to the Caribbeans believe they understand the land and how it works and the needs and desires of its people, be them the poor people or the ruling classes, but they really don't. They look at this place, at this bizarre place that's so different, even on a, uh, in terms of its weather, its natural resources, its fauna, it's so different from where they come from and they still see it through their European eyes, and they still believe that it follows the same dynamics as their homeland. This lack of understanding goes both ways, by the way, and in Antoinette's fascination for England, Mr. Rochester also perceives that same inability to understand a land that's so very different from where she comes from. One of my favorite passages of the novel deals specifically with this topic and goes, her mind was already made up about England. Some romantic novel, a stray remark never forgotten, a sketch, a picture, a song, a waltz, some note of music, and her ideas were fixed. About England and about Europe. 
I could not change them and probably nothing would. Reality might disconcert her, bewilder her, hurt her, but it would not be reality. It would be only a mistake, a misfortune, a wrong path taken. Her fixed ideas would never change. Nothing that I told her influenced her at all. Which goes, of course, to a deeper level in terms of dealing with how we behave and how we interact with reality around us, even beyond the main theme and concern of these different cultures, the clash of these different worlds and the horrible consequences of power uh, in, the, in the form of the imperialist pursuit when it's introduced in this already difficult dynamic. Beyond all of these concerns that are specific to a place in time, White Sargasso sees is concerned with how our perception of reality is somehow entirely disconnected with the reality out there and comes from our past experiences, our prejudice, our ideas we have about a given place, about the role you're supposed to play, about, uh, to play, uh, about how the relationship between a husband and a wife should go, and on the consequences of the fact that when we stick to these pre-made concepts, in spite of what our experience and of what our feelings teach us, bad stuff is bound to happen. In presenting the clash between these two very different worlds and in focusing on the misery and on the psychological turmoil of Antoinette, White Sargasso Seas was really a masterful and amazing novel. And this clash that I talked about is not just the, the clash of somebody who travels to a different land and is unable to adapt to it. It's the paradoxical situation where you end up hating what's strange what out, what's outside yourself and your uh, ideas about the world at the same time as you're inevitably fascinated by it. And this book has a lot to say again about the imperialist experience, but it has a lot to say about everything out there, about every sort of interaction where two different cultural groups are fused with one another, end up in conflict, even though they are inevitably attracted to one another. And one of my favorite passages about that comes very late into the novel. Uh, it's narrated from Mr. Rochester's perspective. He is entirely fed up with the Caribbeans. He is going back to England with Antoinette in uh, tow as his wife. And he reflects that, he says, I was tired of these people. I disliked their laughter and their tears, their flattery and envy, conceit and deceit. And I hated the place. I hated the mountains and the hills, the rivers and the rain. I hated the sunsets of whatever color. I hated its beauty and its magic and the secret I would never know. I hated its indifference and the cruelty which was part of its loveliness. Above all, I hated her. For she belonged to the magic and the loveliness. She had left me thirsty, and all my life would be thirst and longing for what I had lost before I found it. And I think it's clear from these lines that this hatred is part, it's, it's, um, it's, it comes from a lack of understanding. It comes from an inability to connect with this new world that fascinates uh, Mr. Rochester, but it's just beyond his comprehension. And as such causes fear, and as we all know, fear leads to hate. I think I almost quoted Star Wars by mistake. Anyway, White Sargasso Seas connects with Jane Eyre, interacts on it, comments on it, rewrites it in beautiful, wonderful ways. Uh, I especially loved the shift, the occasional shift to the present tense in the narrative, which is a, a, one, of my, one of my favorite narrative tricks in Jane Eyre. I really loved it, uh, as I remarked upon in my recent review of the novel. The big question that I want to address before I finish, I wrap up, wrap up this review is, do you need to have read Jane Eyre before you read White Sargasso Seas? That's a very important question to me. Uh, we live in a very superficially intertextual culture where lots of art forms from hip-hop to YouTube videos and clips is extremely and explicitly referential and where you very often get to know an artwork from its parody or from its remake rather than from the original. But you should still be able to, uh, to enjoy the later work, otherwise that makes it, in, in my view at least, if you cannot appreciate it by itself, then it doesn't become, it, it, it remains bound in a borderline marginal realm rather than like lifting off as an artwork in itself. What I'm trying to express here is that if um, White Sargasso Seas is just 
a, a rewriting commentary on Jane Eyre that you need, that you cannot appreciate by itself, then it kind of becomes a second resource rather than a novel in its own right. I, paradoxically, for all that I waited until I'd read Jane Eyre to read this novel, now I probably cannot pass judgment on that side of the text. I must confess that it seemed to me like a lot of details would be lost on me if I didn't know how relevant certain of these characters would become in Antoinette's life and in Mr. Rochester's life later on in Jane Eyre. Uh, the Penguin Classics edition I read contains very useful notes that are enlightening on that front, but I'd be very interested to read the experience of readers out there who've read Why Sargasso Sees without any kind of textual assistance, notes, and notes, whatever. Uh, and who hadn't uh, read Jane Eyre at the time. Did you enjoy the book? Were you able to appreciate it? My guess is that yes, I would I probably think that it's such a beautifully narrated, such a tense novel, that you probably end up appreciating and loving it all the same, even if you don't understand all of the games it's playing in that broader conversation of literature I mentioned. More than ever, I, I feel like I say this all the time in recent reviews, but more than ever, I'd like to discuss the book with you in the comment section below. Let me know how you engage with it, what did you think of it, and yeah, I look forward to reading from Big Gen Air fans too. Uh, thank you as always for watching the review, guys, and bye, guys.